Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for Side by Side Digital. I'm your host, Rebecca Shively. Today, we're excited to be joined by Lance Woodbury. Lance is a partner at Keiko ISOM, an agricultural consulting firm. Lance specializes in facilitation and mediation services to family-owned enterprises. We're excited to have him join us today and share his insights around balancing business growth and family dynamics. Lance, thanks for being here today. I'll turn it over to you. Okay, Rebecca, thank you very much. And uh, I'm appreciative of the chance to speak with you today. Again, I'm Lance Woodbury, and uh, I have been helping uh, family farms and ranches and other family businesses for about 25 years or so, um, have helped them navigate the challenges of succession and just the dynamics of working together in a family business. And what I wanna share with you today are both some, some tools that you can use, um, but maybe also some, some ways to think about the family business and the, um, the skills uh, in, in the skills that you need in the family business to uh, make sure it is successful. So I've got about um, 15 or so slides and I'm going to walk through them fairly, fairly quickly, but you um, will have access obviously to this presentation afterwards and the PDF of the slides as well. So the first thing I want to start with is just the idea of the life cycle of a family business. And by life cycle, I mean, sort of, if you think back to the start of the farm, whether that's five years ago or 50 years ago or 150 years ago, uh, family businesses often go through certain stages. And if you think about it, they start in a survival mode where it's almost literally hand to mouth in terms of what's produced is what's consumed, whether that's crops or whether that's cash. Um, and then after a few years, if things go well, those businesses become more stable and you may have some, um, some building of equity in the operation. You may have um, uh, some kids returning to the business or a key employee uh, involved in the business or several key employees. And then if that um, works for a while, you, you end up at this juncture where you're trying to become more professional. And that's where maybe... Uh, you have several um, kids in the business or, um, or several siblings are working with you in the business and you, you start to think about policies and procedures, you know, uh, compensation policies or, or, or other human resource policies like vacations and, and how to think about distribution of profits for, for tax payments or um, family living. And you, you just start to make that business more professional. Oftentimes things like job descriptions and performance evaluations are hallmarks of that professional stage. And then some families choose to move on to an institutional um, level of business. And that is where uh, you may keep the business going even if family members don't return to it or if some family members choose not to participate in the management function of the business. And there are not a lot of examples of this in agriculture, but if you think about um, organizations, maybe like Cargill, where the family still owns the business, but there's not necessarily the family members running the business, though, you know, every now and then you find examples like that. But more and more agricultural families are thinking about this institutional level of business. The question I would have for you today is, in what stage are you or what stage do you find yourself in as you contemplate your family business? Are you stable trying to move to professional? Do you feel like you're in survival mode trying to get to stable? Uh, and so you just think about where you are and what's needed and whether you want to move on to the next stage. Because as I note below, um, there are at times when it makes sense maybe not to move on to the next stage. There are several families I know that you know, don't don't want to become institutional. Uh, in other words, if people from the family aren't working in the business, they may not want to continue the business. So it's just, I put that out there as a framework to help you think about where your family business is and where you want it to go in the future. Another model that I think is helpful to think about is you're always wearing in a family uh, farm or ranch, you're always wearing three hats. You're wearing a hat first and foremost as a family member, whether that's um, you and your spouse or you and your spouse and your children, or if you have siblings in the business. And the currency in that, in that family system is really the, the relationship and how are those relationships and do you sit around the Thanksgiving table together or is there quite a bit of conflict? 
Uh, but you, but it's sort of a non-financial return when you think about wearing the family hat. You also, though, are an owner of a business, and in that case, you're often thinking uh, very much about financial return in the business, your return on assets or your return on equity um, to, to think about. And, and you're wearing the hat of a shareholder or a partner, maybe an heir, uh, maybe you're on the board of directors, but you're thinking with an ownership hat on and uh, you think about dividends and you think about passing ownership to the next generation um, and estate plans, particularly in this political environment, about what that means. Uh, but you also then, the third hat you wear is that of a manager. You're working in the business, whether it's managing people or managing certain parts of the production function. And even within that management hat, you wear you wear lots of hats. You may be focused on HR or agronomy or grain marketing or um, uh, landowner relationships. I mean, you just wear lots of hats in that in that management role. And where we see conflict in the family business, or at least some confusion, is the overlap of those three circles. So when you have a family meeting uh, and you're speaking with your father, let's say, uh, and he's been the leader of the business, are you having a meeting where he's speaking to you as the boss, meaning the management circle? Is he speaking to you as a partner in the business or in the ownership circle? Or is he telling you something as um, as your father, which he's wearing this sort of family hat and has sort of the moral authority, if you will, to ask you to do some things. So thinking about, and, and oftentimes I'll tell families, when you have a meeting, think about what kind of meeting you're having. Are you just having a family get together? Are you having an ownership meeting where the discussion is around the deployment of capital in the business? Or are you having a management meeting where you're talking about the day-to-day -day and who's answering to who and what you're trying to get done day to day. So think about those three hats as you um, go about your work in the family business. There are about 10 different areas, uh, and I won't read them all, but you can sort of see there are, there are a number of areas. When I look back over the years of helping families, these are the areas that just have been what I call risk areas, where there, you know, usually conflict shows up around these things. And if you just pick uh, pick a couple, so like number three is compensation philosophy differences among family members. If you just think about a family business and you think about siblings in a family business, sometimes siblings are paid the same regardless of what they do in the family business. But if you were in a non-family business, you wouldn't pay people you know, the same rate if they were doing different jobs. And so that that sort of conflict between how we do it outside of family business and how we do it inside of family business. Even some people, you know, obviously in farming, when margins are tight, people will work uh, for what I would consider at times under market wages. Well, you wouldn't do that necessarily in a non-family business. So that whole compensation philosophy becomes a, a point of tension. Uh, and number four, lack of clarity and discussion regarding future transitions. Um, years ago, I, I put fathers and sons uh, in a workshop. Um, they were at a workshop together, and I split the dads up and the sons up, and I asked the dads to think about um, the date they were going to retire, and then I asked the sons to think about the date they wanted their fathers to retire, and I had them do that in separate groups, and then I put them together, and I lost all control of the seminar, like total conflict, total chaos, uh, because they really hadn't had those discussions and, and there'd been lots of assumptions about, you know, when someone's going to retire. And I often joke with the senior generation that they're on a rolling five-year plan that every year they say, well, in about five years, I'm going to retire. And for a younger generation producer, that's very difficult to really plan around. And so point is, there are things like this that cause risk to the relationship um, and maybe one more is just, you know, what's a, the number seven of uh, family entrance policy? What do we expect about family members working somewhere else before they come back in to the business? Um, sometimes people expect that to happen so that we bring back family members with certain skills uh, and perspectives. And other people say, no, it's a family business. The kids can come right back. And, um, and there's some challenges there that, that happen because of differences there. So think about these areas of risk 
and uh, how you try and mitigate these as you think about the future, just like you would think about um, marketing risk with, with livestock or with crops. This is family business risk here. And so think about these items as you think about planning for the future. You know, generally when we think about healthy family businesses, we see certain processes that indicate the health of the business. So there's good communication, there's good um, uh, discussion about what expectations people have of one another. There's some consensus on the vision for the future of the operation and when things are gonna happen and what roles we want people to play. We've got a good decision-making process. We've got some processes in place to attract and develop good people. Uh, and then we've also got ways to make sure our key people uh, are developing and are um, aware of their strengths and weaknesses. Um, we sometimes like, you know, like to see that family businesses have awareness of other management strategies and uh, how other businesses work and a commitment to work through conflict. And finally, understanding a good understanding of financial information, um, which uh, Farm Credit Services of America and Frontier Farm Credit are, are both really good about uh, communicating and, and encouraging you to understand your financial position. And I know because I work with uh, folks in, in uh, both systems. So um, you combine all those things and you have a healthy business. And at the bottom, I say there, you know, recognize the value of being a family business, but act as if you are not one meaning the way to think successfully about family business sometimes is treat it as if it wasn't your family, meaning job descriptions and performance evaluations and discussions about compensation and specific goals and measurements and timelines around transitions and, you know, things you would expect if you were in a business without family members in it. And if you do that well, it often comes to actually help the family business. There are two or three mindset shifts that I think are important to recognize in a family business. And, um, and one is thinking about whether you are a family business or whether you are an enterprising family. And what I mean by that is sometimes people get hung up in, hey, we're a family farm or we're a family ranch and we always have to be this family farm or this family ranch. And it may be that the environment, your proximity to an urban area, the opportunities with different kinds of crops or land development or other things, maybe that there are potentially other businesses to be in. And if you're locked into, we have to be a family farm instead of we can be an enterprising family, sometimes you'll take options off the table that maybe you should consider. So think about whether you're a family business or an enterprising family. Other times people think of themselves as heirs, so they're recipients of assets from prior generations. But really when that happens, they need to shift and think as partners in business together. And so are we inheriting um, an asset or a share of an entity, or are we inheriting actually a vehicle by which we are now partners and need to define our partnership relationship and, and if that's the case, if we're actually partners in a business, it gets us thinking about what does that business need to look like tomorrow? Whereas when you have the air hat on, you just mainly think about passing the same business. But if you think about being a partner in a business, you start, it gives you a little more freedom, I think, to think about how the business needs to change to be successful in the future. And finally, one other mindset shift, and that's from uh, thinking as an operator to thinking as an owner. And, and this came from an article in Harvard Business Review by one of the longstanding kind of gurus in the family business field. Uh, and he just had a good laundry list of things that help you think in terms of an ownership mentality. So, for example, designing activities that encourage lots of family participation in the business. I know several families where, and many of you on this call probably at times get your uh, sons and daughters involved in the farm at a very young age. Well, how do you do that with cousins and other people that may not live uh, on, the, on the farm, but, but still have emotional attachment to the farm? Um, you see a bullet there that says develop both family and non-family talent. So when you think about 
uh, again, in a non-family business, you would say, as an owner, we got to keep developing uh, talent and provide workshops and opportunities and educational opportunities like this for people to grow and thrive in. Uh, and, and so you need to keep doing that as an owner of a business, uh, figuring out how to strategically experiment with, with new crops, new business opportunities, and, and then um, define what, what makes one a winner and one a loser and being willing to cut the losers off quickly and uh, stay with the winners. I mean, th those are all kind of ownership, um, ownership mentalities. And, and so those three, and ending with this operators to owners are just three sort of mindsets that I would encourage you to explore some more. I want to shift quickly to communication. Um, people sometimes say, you know, is there a way to prevent conflict in the family business? And um, I, I don't know if you prevent all conflict, but most conflict that does happen stems from communication challenges. And so I just want to help you think about that for a couple of minutes. Um, you know, we often talk about when you want to show that you're a good listener, you repeat what someone says to you. You paraphrase or summarize what they say, and that makes the person feel heard. And it does, but a little um, uh, insight for you is that if you can name the emotion, like the person sounds angry or frustrated or they sound happy or joyful, when you can name that emotion, and I want you to try this uh, sometime later today with someone just try and name the emotion. Well, you sound you sound kind of down, or man, you sound kind of excited. And when you identify the emotion, something clicks in a person that makes them feel like you understand how they feel, which is really empathy, and that that can be pretty powerful. And if you want to take a one notch further, try and articulate why someone is important to you or why their opinions count and they will feel valued. So, so think about it as a continuum. You can make someone feel heard, you can make them feel felt, or you can make them feel valued. And the further you get to the right here, to the valued perspective, the more conflict you will prevent by, help, by having that kind of communication. Because you often go through all three phases to get to the valued part of that. Um, so try to make somebody feel valued. And even if you disagree with them, Hey, I appreciate your opinion, and, and what you do here is really important. I, I don't agree with you today, but I really like the fact that you've shared your opinion. I mean, that, that helps someone, even though it's sometimes hard to say that, uh, if you can do that sincerely, it helps someone um, sort of come along with you in, uh, in the relationship. Another sort of communication um, sort of thing to think about um, is, is this house, this crude looking house, but the sort of the roof of the house has four elements that make a good relationship. And one of them is you have to have some commonality or some connection to someone. You need to have respectful treatment with that person. You need to feel like you can trust them. And oftentimes that's characterized by willingness to share what you're feeling or what you're concerned about. And then you need to feel like they're not going to throw you under the bus with you. You need to feel like there's some protection, like there's some confidentiality or there's some recognition of vulnerability. And, and the way I want you to think about this is when the relationship's not going well with a family member, with a key employee, with a parent, whomever, think about what's missing here. Think about what's missing in this top part of the house. The bottom part is just... Um, something I have found helpful to encourage people, you know, we often talk about having better boundaries in relationships. And so I just thought it would be good to talk about well, what do we mean by boundaries? Well, there's mental boundaries around and, and, you know, mental health is an important topic to talk about right now, but you know, what you will or will not allow yourself to think or believe um, about yourself or about others. Verbal boundaries, what you'll say or not say, you know, I have some families that say, Hey, when I'm, disappointed with a family member, I'm not going to go tell another family member because that creates a triangle that's unhealthy in the business. So I'm going to have some verbal boundaries and say, if I've got an issue with someone, I'm going to go talk to them directly, or I'm going to get someone to go with me to talk to that person so that we can resolve the conflict. There's behavioral boundaries, what you'll tolerate or not tolerate from others that could range um, 
from language to how people are treated, but you sort of say, hey, I've got some boundaries around this. And then finally, time, what you will or will not devote your time, energy, and attention to. And again, what makes good relationships with people is the elements in the top part of the house and the boundaries in the bottom part of the house. So if relationships not working, think about where these things uh, fit in to that, to that um, function of the relationship. I want to give you a, just a quick model to help you think about how to reach a kind of a good agreement with someone. So say, say you're in a negotiation or say you're struggling with someone trying to find common ground. There are three sort of elements of a good agreement. And the first one is just the substance of the, what the substance of the agreement. In other words, what are the terms? Think about it. And this is sort of a, a um, trite example, but think about buying a used car. Uh, from someone. There's the price of the car. And, and if you're going to buy the car or tractor or whatever it is, the price has to be right. That's the substance of it. There's also the process of how you get there. And if you've ever gone to buy a car and you're in talking to a salesman and he or she says, well, hold on a second, I have to go check with my manager. And they keep you in this little cubicle or this little room and they turn the heat up and you're sweating and you're waiting for the manager to come back. And the point is they're using a process that um, most people don't like. And so even if the price is right, if you have to go through that process to get there, you may walk away from the deal. You may not get an agreement. So not only do you have to have the price right, but you have to have the process to get there. And then finally, there has to be enough relationship, meaning there has to be enough connection and security present that you feel like you can trust the person at some level you're dealing with. And I would encourage you to think about this model in terms of reaching agreement as a family. You know, oftentimes we assume that we trust our family members, but sometimes we don't. And if we don't, we need to talk about that because if you don't trust a family member, an in-law, whatever, you're not going to get to a good agreement usually. And, and you need to think about the process of how we make decisions because sometimes the um, you know the the you, you think like in a succession planning process we think the power has maybe started to shift to the next generation but all of a sudden the senior generation says nope we're going to do it this way and all the work you've done to to work on the transition because they didn't follow the process the agreement around the transition kind of falls apart because they sort of uh, exerted their authority and, and shut down the process. So point is, think about in any decision you're making or any agreement you're trying to reach, how there's the deal, the process, or how you got to the deal, and then there's the people side of it. Can you trust the other people? When you're working through conflict, uh, I just, I would encourage you to come back to this chart, and there's kind of three three sort of spots in the chart on the left. You have to admit a conflict exists and that it's worth resolving and then ask if the other party is willing to work on it. So before you even get to solving the conflict, you just got to say, hey, is this worth talking about? And, uh, and do I want to talk about it? Does the other person want to talk, talk about it? If the answer to that question is yes, then you really need to think about um, how you might have contributed to the conflict or how your actions might have been perceived, and then really listen and go back to that listening slide. Can you make the other person feel felt? Can you understand where they're coming from? Can you put yourself in their shoes? And can you describe how they're feeling? So when I'm doing a mediation, I'll have one party describe how the other party is feeling. And we do that so that they understand, um, understand both sides understand where they're each coming from and can articulate it. And if you do that well, then you get a chance to sort of explain your side of the story. You um, really, the point of trying to resolve conflict is you agree you've both been hurt. You didn't intend to hurt one another, but that is what's happened. And then this last on the far kind of bottom right-hand corner, this is what I call the magic question. And when you're in a conflict with someone, again, family member, vendor, uh, landowner, employee, whatever, Ask this question, what do you need to see or hear from the other person in order to move forward? In other words, resolving conflict is all about the future. 
So if you're in a conflict with someone in a family business or really any business, you want to ask, what do you need to see or hear from that person? See implies behavior. So there needs to be some different behavior. Hear needs, implies communication. So maybe you need to hear an apology from someone. What do you need to see or hear in order to move forward? And if, if you kind of go through this process and you end with that question, um, most times that's pretty successful about moving the relationship to a different place. It usually never goes back to what it was before the conflict, but it is helpful in trying to um, move the relationship forward. Just uh, another kind of model that's helpful in decision-making is um, when you think about making a decision about, say it's a new, um, say it's a new asset on the farm or on the ranch, you start with yourself and, and you start on that reflection, kind of the two o'clock part of the circle and say, well, what do I think about that? Do I, do I need a new asset? Let's call it a tractor. Do I need a new tractor? Do I not need a new tractor? How many hours does my old one have? Does it have enough horsepower? That kind of stuff. Then if you're in a family business, you need to come down to this mutual education phase at about four or five o'clock and turn I knowledge into we knowledge, meaning turn what you think, go around the table and ask what everybody else thinks about that tractor in the hours and the horsepower and whether it's time to do something different. And then if it is, then you get into the planning mode where you say, well, let's, let's lease a new one or let's look at buying a new one or let's look at buying a used one. And you sort of get into thinking about, okay, we all agree that we need something different. Let's do some planning and brainstorming about what that is. And then if that works, you, you go ahead and implement the um, decision. You buy the tractor, you lease the tractor, whatever you do. The point is you follow a circle and you've brought everybody along. What tends to happen in family businesses is that because people are historically um, known to each other, we make assumptions about what we think the other person wants or wants to do. And then we go ahead and act because slowing down to have this kind of communication feels inefficient. And so we don't do enough of it. And what happens is some people in the family kind of get most of the way around this circle and other people aren't with them. So the family's not caught up in moving around the circle together. And, and whether you're talking about a big decision or a little decision, uh, when you think about involving other people, this model is really helpful. And I've used it for years to help just work through any, whether it's a financial decision, whether it's a succession decision, whether it's a decision about expansion or contracting the business, whatever it might be, think about using this model as a family to help make that decision. I want to just quickly mention um, one of the things that, that we do is facilitate a number of peer groups, and um, we see increasing numbers of people uh, get interested in those, and it's because they gain a lot from getting together in a group, and those might just be, you know, some networking and education. This, uh, although you all aren't interacting with each other today, you're mainly interacting with me. This is a, a sort of form of, um, of educational uh, a peer group that, um, that Side by Side's doing. But through this, you get everything from, you know, self-awareness of, of your own strengths and weaknesses to, to ideas and connections to talents to resources and things. And, and when you're meeting with a group in person, you, you get really some mentors, you get guides along your journey of growth. So um, that's one way that you can think about getting better in a family business is to look for um, folks that you might join a peer group with. And then I heard this years ago uh, and, and heard a person talk about it. And then I've noticed it in the Wall Street Journal. They often ask, and I don't think they do it every week, but, but like I think in a lot of the Saturday Wall Street Journals, They'll ask somebody who's on your personal board of directors. The idea here is that there are people in your life who are on your board of directors. They may not even know they're on your board of directors, but they are the people you go to for wisdom about certain decisions in your family, in your business, uh, whatever the case might be. And, and I would just encourage you to formalize this concept a little bit and write down three or four names of people who either are on your personal board of directors or that you would like to have on your personal board of directors. And I would even encourage you to, to, to take a step and, and tell them they're on your personal board of directors. And um, it, it's a pretty powerful concept when you think about 
um, particularly uh, those of you at the younger end of the age spectrum, as you think about the next several decades in farming or ranching, that personal board of directors to guide you can be a really powerful, powerful concept. And, and finally, um, you know, as it relates to family businesses, as it relates to peer groups, you know, I, I always come back to this quote by C.S. Lewis, where basically, you know, you realize that everybody working through agricultural family business issues is, is sort of dealing with the same stuff. And when you're in a rural community and you're in a growing business and sometimes you feel like you've got a target on your back a little bit or there's not a lot of support, um, you, you got to find people to cultivate friendships with because I guarantee you what you are going through as a family business is the same thing that many other family businesses are going through. And you just have to find the people that you can talk to and share things with. And when you find those folks and you think about going back through all these slides I've gone through, when you find those folks going through all those processes and improving your family business and getting it from the survival to the stable, to the professional, to the institutional mode is much easier to do when you have friends that are along with you for the journey. So with that, I, I want to wrap up and say thanks for the opportunity to be with you. Uh, my email address is here. If you have any questions, feel free to uh, email me. I also write a column in Progressive Farmer magazine about family business, and uh, you can see that. I have a personal website that's lancewoodbury.com. Go there, and we have a couple of newsletters you can also sign up for. So with that, um, Rebecca, maybe I'll turn it back to you and ask if there are any questions I can answer. Sure. Thanks, Lance. Um, and again, for those of you in the audience, keep those questions coming. We have a couple that have come in already. Um, this is kind of an interesting one. In your experience, Lance, are there any conflicts that cannot be solved? And then how do you move forward from something like that? Yeah, uh, two, quick two quick answers to that. One is when you, when you get into conflicts around values, about what people really believe, it, it's sometimes hard to find middle ground. Um, if, if you just have certain beliefs about um, about people or certain ways of treating people or behavior, things like that. Uh, those can be hard conflicts to resolve. And, and to be honest with you, when we can't resolve them, we look at doing something different. And oftentimes that's um, maybe splitting the business. And, and I will tell you this, um, there are lots of family business consultants like to quote the failure rate of family businesses and this idea that it's harder and harder and harder to pass it on. Sometimes that's the right answer to not pass on the family business because you're passing the conflict right along with it. And so sometimes if you can split up the business collaboratively, in other words, if you've come to impasse on certain conflicts or things and they seem irresolvable, if you can agree to collaboratively come at the process of dissolution of the business, that isn't a bad thing. In other words, sometimes people feel so, so strongly that they have to keep the business together they end up keeping the business together and the family ends up hating each other. And that's not a, that's not a win-win if you keep the business, but don't keep the family. So sometimes it is important to keep that relationship. We re recognize we can't be in business together effectively. And you say, let's collaboratively break it up. And uh, I, I do quite a bit of that work actually. And if people come at it right, uh, you can, you, you can come to a successful resolution. Is it what you hoped maybe 20 years ago or 10 years ago or something. No, but it may practically be the best answer and it may actually keep people in some form of family relationship. Great. Maybe kind of a similar question here. Um, someone asks in your work, are there certain conflicts that you see kind of similar across all farm families? Are there some common things that you just see over and over again that everyone seems to go through? And can you share yeah. a little bit about some of those? Yeah. Yeah. The compensation one is pretty common across businesses. And again, in part, because you've come out of a family system where the, the sort of, we treat everybody the same because they're family members. When you translate that into compensation, and you start paying everybody equally, but not everybody's doing the same job. And then they go get married and their spouses don't think that they should be paid equally. So the in-laws become a factor in, in that uh, conversation. So that's pretty common. Another one that's common that you all will identify with is when you have multiple children and not all of them came back to the farm, how do you work through the process of, of dividing the assets? And that can be a fairly conflictual event based on, on what um, expectations 
family members have about things. Uh, so compensation. So, so, you know, a lot of the, Rebecca, a lot of the common conflicts come up around financial issues. They're not always rooted in financial issues, but a lot of them come up around financial issues. And I would say compensation and division of assets are two that are, are pretty common across. Probably the third one is, you know, usually people have expectations of one another, but because we're brothers and sisters and parents and cousins and all these things, we don't really talk about expectations when we're working together in the business. If you were going into a non-family business, you would have a job description and be very clear. Like I'm sure it, that Rebecca, you have a job description and you're measured against that job description. Very few families actually will do that with family members. And so there tends to be a fair amount of conflict uh, at times wrapped up in what are people's expectations of one another, particularly when they're not meeting them, but they don't have a, a, a document or a process to fall back on. And so, so they have a lot of conflict there. So those would be some common ones across families. Great. I'm sure some of those sound pretty familiar to our listeners in the audience. Um, here's an interesting one. How do you navigate having one person who tends to be negative no matter what when you're trying to work through a conflict? How do you kind of deal with maybe the negative Nelly in the room? I would say, you know, back there on one of those slides, I talked about the importance of self-awareness and knowing your impact on others. And um, what I have found, whether it's someone being negative or just, just a certain type of behavior that is really hard to work with, um, I figure out some way to either pull that person aside uh, to say, do, do you understand the impact of your behavior on others and what that is leading us to as a group? That when you speak and everything's negative, you bring the group down. What I have found is usually that's not someone's intention. Now, getting them to hear that feedback, if you're a brother or a sister or a parent to that person, um, sometimes they can't hear it because you've been around them too long. Um, so you have to sort of get creative about ways to say it. But the reality is you're not, you're not going to change that person. Only they are going to decide they're going to change. And the only way they decide they're going to change is if they see the consequences of their behavior and it's leading to something they don't want. So you may have to spell that out for them and say, hey, when you're negative all the time, this is what it causes me to feel. And is that what you intend? Is that what you intend to have happen is to have us feel that way? Uh, usually that's not the intent of the person. So I try and try and draw that out. Great. Really good advice there. Um, we had a question come through the chat. In your opinion, if one sibling is active in the farming operation and has two that aren't involved, how do you determine between I guess that same issue, what's equal and what's fair when it comes for um, time for the parents to split the assets? Yeah, it, it usually, I usually start with the parents and I talk to them about what their guiding principles are. Um, and, and again, it's sort of a pro and con approach that if they say, hey, I'm going to treat everybody equally in my estate, then helping them understand what may be disadvantaged that puts the person at who came back to the farm in terms of being in control of their own destiny and, and some of the things they gave up by coming back to the farm. So, so I usually start that conversation at the parent level to say, let's really think through what the outcome of your principle that everybody has to be equal, what that's going to lead to if you institute that. And the, 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 particularly if it's like three siblings and two are off the farm and one's on the farm. I mean, usually that's, you know, you know, the, the ability for the person on the farm to buy out the two siblings off the farm with today's land prices and, and cause some of the margins in farming and whatnot, I mean, it's just not doable. And so you have to sort of walk through the parents, like, well, what do you think the outcome of that's going to be 20 or 30 years from now? And does that matter? And what's it mean to your goal of keeping the farm together? So, so I kind of walk people through, and I would encourage you to do the same, walk people through the pros and cons of the approach, not just for today's current estate planning environment, but what that's likely to result in. And does that result match up with the goals that they've usually articulated, which is often to keep the farm together? Well, you don't keep something together by putting people with wildly diverse backgrounds in business together. That's usually a recipe for it going the other way. <laughs> so, so I try and point that out. 
Yeah, maybe kind of a related question here. Um, any advice for starting some of those initial conversations if my parents aren't willing to talk about things? It's tough. Um, sometimes I encourage people to think about who their parents talk to. And is there somebody that um, is a bridge between you and your parents? It could be a, a minister. It could be another business owner in town. It could be, it could be your accountant. It could be your lender. You know, the person at Farm Credit who helps you. Um, may you know somebody like that may be able to sit down with your parents and say, "Hey, uh, it would be wise." You know, I, I would recommend that you have some discussions. So sometimes their parents aren't going to hear it from their kids. So you got to find somebody else who might bridge that conversation with them. The other thing you can do is um, if you go look at my Progressive Farmer articles. Just cut those out and leave them around the house in certain places. And they're, oh, what's it? You know, they'll get the hint after a while that, hey, I need to do something because I keep seeing these articles by Lance telling me we got to talk about this stuff as a family. But in all seriousness, I think a bridge, finding a person who can be a bridge if the parents won't engage with you in that conversation, but don't limit it to just their friends. Think about the professional advisors that help you and use your lender, use your CPA as resources in that conversation. Yeah, really good advice. Also, I like the idea of just leaving notes on the bathroom mirror yeah. for them to see. <laughs> Maybe the refrigerator, you can get creative with it. Right. That's right. That's right. Uh, we probably have time for a couple more questions here. Um, here's one that's maybe a little bit more on the positive spin of things, but the the families who do things really well, what are some of kind of the commonalities or best practices that you've seen that make the successful ones really successful? Yeah, I would say over communication. I mean, what feels like inefficiency to many families from a communication standpoint, the families that do it well, and that by, by communication, I don't mean they have a meeting every you know, every week for hours on end. I mean, they're just in touch with each other communication wise. They are, so they, they, you know, they ask questions of each other's development, like what would help you in your role or what's important to you to be successful. So there's sort of this care for other family members and this, this sort of ongoing dialogue or ongoing communication about how we're doing as a, as a family, there's, there's usually quite a bit more transparency in those families. So talking about balance sheets and, and income statements and marketing plans and, you know, talking through the finances of the business um, usually is, is something I see in healthy, healthy families. Um, and I, you know, that slide that kind of walk through healthy businesses have healthy processes. A lot of those things show up, but, but I would say, most of the time, it's their sort of level of attention to communication and people's opinions and needs. They tend to include in-laws in conversation. Some families don't like to include in-laws. I would say they're usually headed for some conflict. If you don't get the person who your son or daughter spends the majority of their personal time with, you don't get that person at the table. Uh, and all they hear is the message from their spouse instead of the broader family unit you're usually headed for some tough conversations down the road. So, so that kind of communication stuff is what I would come back to and say, if, if you're talking about stuff as a family, you're, you're much more likely to prevent some of the issues that we see. What one other thing I might say to Rebecca is people are sometimes afraid of conflict and that's in the way, like, like if you won't go have the tough conversation because you fear conflict, that, that, creates an environment where the conflicts build and build and build, and then something little happens and it all blows up because people were afraid of conflict. And uh, listen, if you're afraid of conflict, family business is the wrong place to be because there's always, I mean, someone was asking me last night at dinner, um, you know, about a mediator and family businesses. And I told them, you know, it's job security to be a mediator and be around family businesses because there's always conflict. Well, great. We're just at our time here. So that seems like a really good note to end on. But I want to thank Lance again for being here, sharing his insights and his expertise. I want to thank you, everyone in the audience for tuning in today. Um, we hope you'll join us again next month on June 2nd. Um, and until then, take good care and we hope to see you online soon.